that was 500 years and three since the coming of the Noldor to Middle-earth. At that time, Beren and Luthien yet dwelt in Tal Garn, the Green Isle, in the river Adurant. And their son, Dior Eluhil, had to wife Nimloth, kinswoman of Celeborn, prince of Doriath, who was wedded to the Lady Galadriel. The sons of Dior and Nimloth were Elured and Elurin, and a daughter also was born to them, and she was named Elwing, which is Star Spray. For she was born on a night of stars, whose light glittered in the spray of the waterfall of Lanthir Lamath beside her father's house. In the spring of the year after was born in Gondolin, the Arendil half elven the son of Tuor and Idriel Celebrindal. Of surpassing beauty was Earendil, for a light was in his face as the light of heaven. Now Dior, Thingol's heir, bade farewell to Beren and Luthien, and Dior Elohil set himself to raise anew the glory of the kingdom. But now the rumor ran among the scattered elves of Beleriand, and they said, The Silmaril of Feanor burns again in the woods of Doriath. And the oath of the sons of Feanor was waked again from sleep. They came at unawares in the middle of winter, and fought with Dior in the thousand caves. And so befell the second slaying of elf by elf. Thus Doriath was destroyed and never rose again. But the sons of Feanor gained not what they sought, for a remnant of the people fled before them, and with them was Elwing, Dior's daughter. And they escaped, and bearing with them the Silmaril, they came in time to the mouths of the river Sirion by the sea. At last, in the year when Earendil was seven years old, Morgoth was ready. The host of Morgoth came over the northern hills, where the height was greatest, and the watch least vigilant. And there was no stay in the advance of the foe, until they were beneath the very walls of Gondolin, and the city was beleaguered without hope. And of the defense of the tower of Turgon by the people of his household, until the tower was overthrown. And mighty was its fall, and the fall of Turgon in its ruin. Thus, led by Tuor, son of Huor, the remnant of Gondolin passed over the mountains and came down into the Vale of Sirion. Idril and Tuor departed from Nan Tathrin and went southwards down the river to the sea. And they dwelt there by the mouths of Sirion and joined their people to the company of Elwing, Dior's daughter, that had fled thither but a little while before. In those days, Tuor felt old age creep upon him, and ever a longing for the deeps of the sea grew stronger in his heart. Therefore, he built a great ship, and he named it Earamme, which is sea wind. And with Idril Celebrinda, he set sail into the sunset in the west, and came no more into any tale or song. Bright Earendil was then lord of the people that dwelt nigh to Sirion's mountains, and he took to wife Elwin the Fair.
bore to him Elrond and Elros, who are called the Half Elrond. Yet Eärendil could not rest, and his voyages about the shores of the Hitherlands eased not his unquiet. Two purposes grew in his heart, blended as one in longing for the wide sea. He sought to sail thereon, seeking after Tuor and Ebrin, who returned not. And he thought to find, perhaps, the last shore, and bring, ere he died, the message of elves and men to the Valar in the west, that should move their hearts to pity for the sorrows of Middle-earth. With the aid of Kyrna, the Yarendil built Vingilot the Fawn Flower. In the Lay of the Arendil is many a thing sung of his adventures in the deep and in lands untrodden, and in many seas and in many isles. But Elwyn was not with him, and she sat in sorrow by the mouths of Sirion. Eärendil found not Tuor, nor Idril, nor came he ever on that journey to the shores of Valinor, defeated by shadows and enchantment, driven by repelling winds, until in longing for Elwyn, he turned homeward towards the coast of Beleriand. Now when first the tidings came to Maethros that Elwyn yet lived, and dwelt in possession of the Silmaril by the mouths of Sirion, he repenting of the deeds in Doriath, withheld his hand. But in time, the knowledge of their oath unfulfilled returned to torment him and his brothers. And gathering from their wandering hunting paths, they sent messages to the havens of friendship and yet of stern demand. Then Elwing and the people of Sirion would not yield the jewel which Beren had won and Luthien had worn and for which Dior the Fair was slain. And so they came to pass, the last and cruelest of the slayings of Elf by Elf. And that was the third of the great wrongs achieved by the accursed oath. For the sons of Feanor that yet lived came down suddenly upon the exiles of Gondolin and the remnant of Doriath and destroyed them. In that battle some of their people stood aside and some few rebelled and were slain upon the other part, aiding Elwing against their own lords. For such was the sorrow and confusion in the hearts of the Eldar in those days. But Maedhros and Maglor won the day, though they alone remained thereafter of the sons of Feanor, for both Amrod and Amras were slain. Too late the ships of Círdan and Gil-galad the High King came hasting to the aid of the elves of Sirion, and Elwing was gone, and her sons. Then such few of that people as did not perish in the assault joined themselves to Gil-galad and went with him to Balar. And they told that Elros and Elrond were taken captive, but Elwing, with the Silmaril upon her breast, had cast herself into the sea. Thus Maedhros and Maglor gained not the jewel, but it was not lost. For Ulmo bore up Elwing out of the waves, and he gave her the likeness of a great white bird, and upon her breast there shone as a star the Silmaril, as she flew over the water to seek Eärendil, her beloved. And it is sung that she fell from the air upon the timbers of Vingilot in a swoon, nigh unto death for the urgency of her speed, and Eärendil took her to his bosom. But in the morning, with marvelling eyes, he beheld his wife in her own form beside him, with her hair upon his face, and she slept. Great was the sorrow of Eärendil and Elwing for the ruin of the havens of Syria, and the captivity of their sons, and they feared that they would be slain. But it was not so. 
for Maglor took pity upon Elros and Elrond, and he cherished them. And love grew after between them, as little might be thought. Maglor's heart was sick and weary with the burden of the dreadful oath. Eärendil saw now no hope left in the lands of Middle-earth, and he turned again in despair, and came not home, but sought back once more to Valinor with Elwyn at his side. And the wise have said that it was by reason of the power of that holy jewel that they came in time to waters that no vessels save those of the Teleri had known. And they came to the Enchanted Isles, and escaped their enchantment. And they came into the shadowy seas and passed their shadows. And Eärendil went into Valinor and to the halls of Valimar, and never again set foot upon the lands of men. This is my decree concerning them. To Eärendil and to Elwing and to their sons shall be given leave each to choose freely to which kindred their fates shall be joined and under which kindred they shall be judged. Now when first Vingilot was set to sail in the seas of heaven, it rose unlooked for, glittering and bright. And the people of Middle-earth beheld it from afar and wondered, and they took it for a sign and called it Gil Esther, the star of high hope. And when this new star was seen at evening, Maedros spoke to Maglor, his brother, and he said, Surely that is a Silmaril that shines now in the west. Maglor answered, If it be truly the Silmaril which we saw cast into the sea that rises again by the power of the Valar, then let us be glad. For its glory is seen now by many, and is yet secure from all evil. anguish and despair, he cast himself into a gaping chasm filled with fire, 
and so ended. And the Silmaril that he bore was taken into the bosom of the earth. And it is told of Naglor that he could not endure the pain with which the Silmaril tormented him. And he cast it at last into the sea. And thereafter he wandered ever upon the shores, singing in pain and regret beside the waves. In those days, there was a great building of ships upon the shores of the Western Sea. And thence, in many a fleet, the Eldar set sail into the West, and came never back to the lands of weeping and of war. And when they came into the West, the elves of Beleriand dwelt upon Tol Aresia, the lonely isle that looks both West and East, whence they might come even to Valinor. They were admitted again to the love of Manwe, and the pardon of the Valar, and the Teleri forgave their ancient grief, and the curse was laid to rest. Yet not all the Eldalia were willing to forsake the hither lands where they had long suffered and long dwelt, and some lingered many an age in Middle-earth. Among those were Círdan the shipwright, and Celeborn of Doriath, with Galadriel his wife who alone remained of those who led the Noldor to exile in Valeria. In Middle-earth dwelt also Gil-galad the High King, and with him was Elrond half-elven, who chose, as was granted to him, to be numbered among the Eldar. But Elros, his brother, chose to abide with men, and from these brethren alone has come among men the blood of the firstborn, and the strain of the spirits divine that were before Arda. <laughs>